I think a good Arizona sheriff, one, he had to be, he had to be a good politician and he had to be, he had to uh, sometimes demonstrate the wisdom of Solomon, uh, even if it was just in these little minor cases, uh, which, uh, which he had to make a decision on uh, uh, misdemeanor type things. Um, and he had to be cool under pressure. One of the hardest things to do is when your adrenaline is up and um, you've got a guy over there, maybe it's an instinct, you, you know he really doesn't want to draw that weapon. Being good under pressure, under fire, was maybe uh, in a crisis situation um, because your deputies are all looking at you. And they're looking you, at you for leadership. And you've got to be a leader. The original explorers that really, in a way, discovered Yuma for the rest of the world were the early Spanish explorers. I like to start out by saying the tribal people, the Quetzal people were here for time out of mind. So when the Spanish arrived in Yuma in 1540, they uh, encountered this uh, about probably 1,500 to 2,000 tribal members living at the narrows of the river. Well, this wild, untamed place that lay between California and New Mexico was a pretty godforsaken and desolate, um, ragged mountains and barren deserts. In fact, they said, you know, that uh, it was so hot, it was uh, cowboys could heat their brand and irons just by aiming them up at the sun. And the wind was hot as dragon's breath and yeah, so dry that the lizards carried canteens. Uh, people really exaggerated, but uh, some of it was no exaggeration. It was hard country. Um, the, the, some of the roughest and toughest Indian tribes, warriors, warrior tribes uh, from Yuma all the way across to Apacharia, uh, up in the north of Navajo country and up uh, in the northwest of Mojave. Uh, these were fierce Indians and they were uh, fierce because this was, it was a fierce land and it, the, only the toughest survived. So yeah, as the people came out here and, and at first the Indians were in a vast majority and um, eventually, you know, because of the gold and the silver that was discovered um, here throughout Arizona, uh, it, it, you know, the, the numbers equaled and pretty soon the, the Indians were overwhelmed by sheer numbers. But um, I think the most hostile thing of all, though, was just the, the, the weather, yeah. uh, the environment. That was, that was the toughest. Um, uh, the movies would have you fighting Indians all the time or fighting outlaws all the time, but uh, mostly it was just dealing with, dealing with this harsh, harsh, dry, hot place. And it was very unforgiving. It is today. People find out today the desert is very unforgiving. Uh, it does not tolerate mistakes. It doesn't say, I forgive you. <laughs> the first trappers started showing up in the 1840s. One of those trappers was Kit Carson. We also had the first wagon route established across the country, and the wagon route was established by the Mormon Battalion coming through Yuma, establishing a wagon route uh, for the Mexican-American War. President Polk was uh, the U.S. president at the time, and he really wanted to unite the country ocean to ocean. The Mexican War, um, 1846 to 1848, uh, ended with the uh, signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And with that, all of the land north of the Gila River, and what is Arizona today, all of that land was, um, was now part of the United States. Mexico lost about half her republic. And um, it caused a lot of hard feelings that uh, along the whole 2,000 mile Mexican border from Texas all the way to California. Uh, and a lot of hard feelings for a number of years. It was always an open, pretty much an open border though. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of outlawry that went back and forth across, across the border. But um, uh, in order to build a railroad, um, uh, you could not build a railroad through the land north of the Gila River. And uh, the South wanted to have a, a transcontinental railroad, a southern all weather route. And so they sent a man named James Gadsden to Mexico uh, to negotiate a treaty, they call it the Gadsden Purchase. And that gave us the land from uh, south of the Gila River down to where the border at Nogales, uh, Agua Prieta, Naco, and San Luis is today. So this all happened in the early 1850s. And then um, uh, 1850, uh, the territory of New Mexico was created and Arizona was in the western part. 
the capital city was in Santa Fe, and you had to go through a, a pizzeria to get from Tucson to Santa Fe. There really were no uh, non-Indians north of the Gila River at that time. It was still, it was too wild, and they hadn't found the gold yet. So in those early days, um, the, um, the, the, the southern part of Arizona uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted to separate from New Mexico. And finally, in uh, 1863, the territory of Arizona was created. And it had four original counties, Yuma County, Mojave County, Yavapai County, and Pima County. Those were the four original counties. And that's how it all began. And then they began to split off from there until we had 15 counties. You had to have some measure of order. That is the time when the earliest sheriffs were appointed. They were responsible for everything. They were in, uh, responsible for law enforcement and for collecting fees and taxes and hanging people. I mean, they, they were one-stop shopping for, for law enforcement. Hollywood would have us believe that the sheriff was, uh, you know, something uh, like you see in where he just, he, he hauls drunks out of bars, he conks them on the head with his pistol, puts them in jail, or gets out and has gunfight in the street uh, about every five, ten minutes. And actually, the sheriff was a political office. Uh, he, he, he had to run for that office, so he had to be a bit of a politician. And uh, I've had a lot of sheriffs tell me, though, the longer you're in office, uh, the more people you have to uh, <laughs> you have to uh, arrest or uh, or give them a give them a rough time, maybe, and and you you make an enemy every time you do that. Just about terms were only two years, so you had to almost continuously be campaigning for office to keep the office. Uh, the pay wasn't much, but it was prestigious, and a lot of a lot of men just loved being sheriff. They also were county assessor. They were the assessor, or their job was an assessor. You had to go out and assess the properties for taxes, and then you had to collect the taxes. Taxes. Now in counties, this was a pretty good deal in counties like Cochise County, they were rich uh, when, uh, during the silver boom times because the sheriff got a percentage of the tax money he collected. And that's why these guys were really competing for these jobs, not because they wanted to bring law and order to the mesquite, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, uh, you could have a pretty, you could make 20, 30, 30 maybe $40,000 salary in a year as tax collector. And you know what the salary probably was about maybe uh, if you're look maybe maybe a thousand dollars a year maybe two thousand uh, your salary but that's what it would jump that's what it would bump up to as a tax collector uh, you also had to go out and collect jurors whenever you had to call a grand jury together and this didn't set well like it does with people today even uh, you know you don't like to get that jury summons because you're out there working your ranch or something and they're going to call you away for days and days maybe to sit on some jury and and take you away from your ranch or your farm or your business. So, but he had to do that too. So um, it was, you know, he had some other unpleasant things. But I wanted to mention a couple of things about being a tax collector, uh, because the uh, uh, the sheriff uh, also collected fees from the prostitute houses. So he went by there, and you collected a, a fees in the saloons. And so what the sheriffs would do to politic, help them politic is they, they would go by and collect money uh, and they'd go by on a Saturday afternoon and collect the taxes at the saloon and then all of the bar flies would of course be there and uh, you were expected as sheriff to buy rounds for everybody. The first official sheriff of, of Yuma County was um, Isaac, better known as Ike Bradshaw. And the name Bradshaw is one of the most famous names in Arizona because at one time there was a town called Bradshaw City that had 5,000 people in it. And, and the Bradshaw Mountains uh, are, is that big range of mountains that had so much gold and silver in there. Well, Ike and, um, uh, Ike and his brother Bill came into um, uh, uh, the town of La Paz, which was the county seat for Yuma County at that time, they got a ferry boat business there. They were given the ferry boat business uh, at, um, at what is today Ehrenberg. For a time, it was, um, it, was, it was called Olive City for Olive Oatman, the w young woman who had been captive of, of the tribes, of, se of some tribes for several years. And it was named Olive City, but it eventually became Ehrenberg, Arizona, which is still there today. So that was the site of the um, of the Bradshaw brothers ferry boat uh, ferry boat business, and in 1864, um, uh, the uh, all the four counties 
uh, they, they, they elected sheriffs. It was one of the first things they did was to elect a sheriff. And this was the biggest, the, 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 the top political post in the county. And Ike Bradshaw was, um, was named a sheriff, was, was elected sheriff of, of Yuma County. Now, he must not have been sheriff very long because in 1865 there was a new sheriff, Cornelius Sage, and Cornelius Sage uh, was, um, was killed in the line of duty. Um, and um, uh, he and, he and uh, some, a couple of companions were riding over to Prescott on county business when they were ambushed by Yavapai Indians uh, and they were killed, oh, about 10 miles south of Skull Valley. In 1871, uh, Yuma was still pretty wild, pretty wild uh, country, the whole county was. And there was a, there was a, um, a Mojave uh, Apache or, or Yuma Mojave uh, it's sometimes hard to distinguish, uh, they're, they're so close, but uh, Big Charlie was his name, and Big Charlie had um, killed a woman who had resisted his attempts to steal her blanket, of all things, and he just killed her, so um, uh, the Sheriff uh, Dana went out to uh, make an arrest, and he had a couple of uh, deputies with him, and um, Big Charlie decided uh, he wasn't going to be taken, so a gunfight ensued, and uh, Big Charlie was shot dead. Well, um, Big Charlie's cousin uh, happened to be standing nearby, and he drew back a bow and a, uh, an arrow and fired it in, and he hit Dana uh, in the, uh, the 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 arrow embedded in his in his uh, liver, and uh, it was a fatal wound. And so um, Big Charlie was dead. Uh, the cousin was taken into uh, uh, it, put it put in jail. Uh, he commenced to escape, and they found him, caught him. Oh, by the way, he was sentenced. He was tried and sentenced to be hanged, and then he escaped. And uh, these jails were adobe, and you know it was pretty easy to break out of these things. And um, he uh, made a run for it, got away for a while. They caught him, brought him back, sentenced him to 25 years of hard labor, and um, he was uh, 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 he escaped again. And this time they never found him, never caught him. So. I don't know, we went across the border into Mexico or went up the river to the, some of the tribes up the river and made his escape. When the towns were raw and rough and wild in the early days of the towns, the meaner, the tougher, the deadlier the lawman, the better. But as soon as things kind of got a little more, shall we say, civilized, uh, then this man was just a little bit too tough for this town. And so a lot of times um, men were brought in to tame a town, and as soon as they did, they were, they were kind of no longer welcome, and had to go off and find another town to tame. So civilization, uh, it, and that's why it, it took one, uh, the old saying, it took one to catch one, kind of a thing. Uh, uh, the reputation really counted for a lot. A lot of, a lot of uh, men uh, packing a badge or uh, carrying a badge like to have their, their notoriety uh, advance him. Uh, they they like the word out that this guy's deadly. He's fast as lightning. Uh, he'll shoot. Uh, he'll shoot at first and ask questions later, or uh, he's killed forty men or thirty men or ten men or something. Uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that was an intimidating factor on any would-be troublemaker. The movies would have you think, oh, this some kid wants to challenge you for that, and that's good Hollywood stuff. But um, most of the time, you know, you could your reputation. Uh, the more notorious your reputation was, uh, the more the more power it, it gave you over psychological power over anybody who might try to make trouble. So I have a favorite sheriff, who was a character, large character in the terms of the old west. His name was Gus Livingston, and he was in his prime in the early, at the turn of the century, around 1900. Uh, he had occasion to have to hang a couple of people at the Yuma Territorial Prison, and he really became quite infamous because when he had a hanging, now there were two prisoners, uh, one killed his roommate. He stayed in the prison for a couple of months and then had, went to trial and he was to be hanged at the Yuma Courthouse, which was on the corner of Madison Avenue. So Gus Livingston sent invitations, hand engraved invitations to every citizen of Yuma to come and watch the hanging. Mary Elizabeth Post, Yuma's first school teacher, 
was shocked at this. She closed the school, which faced the courthouse, so the children would be sheltered from this hideous act. And when she found out that all the parents brought the children to witness the hanging, she up and quit. She left town. She went back to San Diego. She eventually came back and they cajoled her and said that won't ever happen again. The sheriff was the hangman, uh, uh, although he could have a hired man. Yuma County had a, a fellow that was, I've seen the picture of him and nobody seems to know his name, but he was a hangman. Uh, and uh, lived along the Colorado River, and he looked like a guy who really enjoyed it. But in fact, that reminds me when uh, the sheriff got $15 for the hanging, that was the fee. And uh, after the hanging, they were supposed to go up, and it was kind of to jerk the legs of the of the man, make sure he was, and that was uh, that was to sort of um, put the stamp on that you have just hanged him, and that's where they got you're pulling my leg, uh, the old saying you're pulling my leg. So um, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, many sheriffs really did not like having to do the hanging. Yeah, you had a lot of other little duties too. You had to keep the jail. You had to be responsible for the health of the prisoners. You had to be responsible for getting them fed. You might, uh, women were in a vast minority when it came to uh, uh, being incarcerated. I think only about 4% of, of, of the prisoners were women, so not much at all. So your you, you sheriff's wife usually had to kind of take care of that, and they had to have separate accommodations, of course, for that, too. So she would be the matron for them. Oh, you had to have a doctor on call, too at all times. Things you don't think about because you don't see it in the movies, but uh, these were other uh, duties and responsibilities. But uh, then you might make a deal uh, uh, with a, uh, a contract out to a restaurant to feed the prisoners for maybe a buck a day. So the sheriff had to do a lot of this administrative uh, duty that you don't, you, again, you don't see in the movies. Yuma was kind of unique in a way. Uh, it was, first it was close to the border. You had San Luis just a short distance over. And you had the Colorado River. Um, and California was close by, and you could escape, you know, jurisdiction just by getting over, getting to the other side of the Colorado. Um, but another thing that you, people don't think of so often when the, of, of Yuma was it was also a railroad town. And uh, I grew up in a railroad town in uh, northern Arizona, and I can tell you there were a lot of transients coming through. And uh, they'll tell you, Western, any Western historians uh, could tell you that the roughest, toughest towns were the railroad towns. And Yuma was a big railroad town. So you had a lot of transients coming through and they're out there in the yards, hobos and on the run from the law. And you apprehend somebody out there and you just, this, this guy's just liable to take you down. So that was part of the danger too. The other part that made Yuma so tough was, um, was the desert around too. Uh, it was a very hostile desert once you got outside outside of Yuma. So uh, uh, even going in pursuit, imagine a posse uh, having to deal. You're dealing with uh, heat stroke and uh, uh, heat uh, heat prostration and all these kinds of things, kinds of things. And so um, the the land itself was hostile. You had the railroad coming through. It was also a highway, and it had people uh, at later in later years. You know when automobiles were going through, you had. Anytime you had transients passing through, um, there was, the, you know, you had the crimes like burglary and things like this uh, to deal with, with just, because you were dealing with, you were, you were dealing with cases that were, guys that were just on the road, on the run. The other thing about Gus Livingston, I happened to have one of the original posters that he put up in town to really enforce law enforcement. So here it is, notice. Every idle man, hobo, and Mac found in Yuma in the next 24 hours will be locked up and put on the rock pile. Get out of town or take the consequences, signed Sheriff Gus Livingston. He was no nonsense. People were passing through Yuma. Some of them stayed maybe longer than they should have. And of course, prostitution was legal uh, in Yuma. And so there was an industry and saloons and a, a street called Maiden Lane. But it wasn't against the law. Uh, but it was a very colorful downtown. It was years ago, uh, my father knew Pete Newman, who was sheriff of Yuma County. 
And uh, I got to ride along with uh, a deputy sheriff by the name of Cliff Bothy at that time. And this was in the late 50s, uh, in 1960. And I rode many hours with them and picked up the routine of what their activities were and what they were doing in them days. And, and the fact that I was from Yuma and a local, uh, went to high school and grade school here. I just wanted to give back to the community that I was raised in. And I thought at that time, what better way to do that than going to, into law enforcement, which which I did. I, I went to work for Bud Yancey back in the latter part of 1962. When I went to work in law enforcement, uh, I was not only a, what they call a deputy sheriff, I was a range deputy because I was a cattle inspector too. So we had dual responsibilities, not only uh, make sure that the cattle thefts were down, investigate them if there was stolen, but we inspected cattle that was sold from rancher to rancher, farmer to farmer, and or shipped to feedlots. And we had lots of huge feedlots in those days in the early 60s back in, in Yuma County. Um, so of course we didn't ride horses like the original sheriffs did, but it got, uh, it got western a lot of times on investigations because, uh, I mean, when you'd go out on a call, we never had backups in them days. We were one man uh, unit and um, of course we didn't drive big <laughs> fancy vehicles or four wheel drives. We had to pick and choose how we got there, but uh, we managed to do it, and it was tough. Uh, I mean, it got John Wayne a lot of times out west here. Back in the in in the uh, early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, we had what they called a tube type radio in, in the patrol cars, and they were huge tubes located in the trunk of the patrol cars, uh, mounted, and then you had a handheld mic just like you do today. But uh, there were certain areas in Yuma County. Remember, we were almost 12,000 square miles at that time. La Paz County had not split off until the early 80s. Uh, there was a lot of dead area in uh, Yuma County. And uh, I can remember one time when I was uh, uh, the resident deputy in Welton, Arizona. I was in a shootout uh, with two suspects that had run from a labor camp. And we got up on the railroad tracks on the old Highway 80. We had no freeway in them days. It was just the old Highway 80 going to Phoenix. And I was in a, actually a gun battle and I couldn't, my radio would not work. I couldn't get out. And uh, it was it was trying times back in them days. Technology other than radios, of course the computer. Now every patrol car has its own computer. Uh, not only do they have sophisticated radios and the outputage and the receiving ability of those radios. Uh, when an officer leaves his vehicle, he's in constant contact for, with a handheld, which we never had before. Uh, furthering your technology issue would be, uh, uh, you know, the ability to read fingerprints a lot faster. DNA, of course, has solved a lot of crimes. It has cleared a lot of people that were sentenced to prisons uh, unjustly, if you will, because of not having the knowledge of DNA uh, evidence. But there's just so much that technology did improve over the years. And I could see it the first year I went to work uh, in, in the early 60s, 1965. Uh, you never had to advise a suspect of his uh, rights per Miranda upon arresting, uh, arresting that person. You had to justify the statement that you got from them uh, suspects once you got into court. But uh, when uh, Escobedo came along, famous case before uh, uh, Miranda did, and uh, the Miranda case actually started in Yuma, ended up in, in Maricopa County. And I actually interviewed uh, uh, Miranda when he was a suspect years ago, but it wasn't me that was named in, in the suit, it was Maricopa County versus uh, uh, Yuma County. But that, uh, what that did actually was made the police officer, deputy sheriff, law enforcement officer, whatever you will, just do his work more diligence. It made him clean up his act a little, if in fact he was heavy handed from time to time. But that technology was actually better for both sides because it was less hassle in court if you did it right. And the evidence was, was introduced in, in evidence in a court of law without any uh, big, large questioning. So that was another aspect of technology. The uh, fact that we were on the border back in the early 60s and late 50s uh, was a challenge to law enforcement. But I, I can say that we had 
great working relationships with with the uh, law enforcement on the other side of the border, our, our sister country, Mexico, uh, as they do today. They have good working relations today. But uh, back in the old days, it was trying, it really was, because I can remember uh, we had so many of the people from Mexico coming across the border, and 99% and, and of them was looking for work, because the country of Mexico was so poor, uh, and, and it still is. But uh, I can remember back uh, being on patrol here locally in the 60s, and uh, Border Patrol would, would stop, uh, and they would call me because I speak Spanish fluently. So I would interpret for the Border Patrol in the old days. Uh, uh, Border Patrol in the old days used to ride horseback along from Morales Dam all the way down to San Luis. They, they actually patrolled on, on horses. And uh, we got to know all the Border Patrol, of course, would back up the deputies like they do today and vice versa. The working relationship with Mexico which has continued on today has been one of the greatest assets to law enforcement in Yuma County. The toughest situation I ever had in Yuma County, well, there's, there's several of them. Uh, number one, uh, probably the investigation of the Tyson family and following that all the way through the courts and me wit witnessing uh, Randy Greenwald be executed at the state prison in Florence. That was a, that was a very trying time in, in my law enforcement career. I enjoyed being sheriff of Yuma County uh, so much. I'd get up every morning. Uh, no two mornings were the same. I mean, you never knew what to expect out there. I enjoyed the fact that I was, again, uh, born locally here, grew up in the community, and I knew most of the, the constituents, the residents of the community. I had a wonderful working staff with me. It makes me so proud uh, to know that I came up through the ranks as I did. And then the, the, the sheriff that preceded me, Sheriff Ralph Ogden, was my chief deputy. He started and came up through the ranks. And then the person that took over when he retired, of course, is Sheriff Leon Wilmot, who we're very proud to have in there today. It gives me great pride to know that I not only worked beside these two, but I hired them and now they're uh, one's a retired sheriff and one is sheriff of Yuma County. I have nothing but fond memories of, of being sheriff of Yuma County. The, the fact that I was able to help a lot of people, some people I couldn't help, but I always told them right up front, I will do what I can to help you. And uh, I, uh, in 1992, when I retired, I felt uh, it was time for somebody else to move on. I felt I could have been sheriff as long as I wanted in Yuma County, but it was it was time for me to move on and let somebody else uh, take over. I started my uh, broadcasting business and radio and television. I've been doing it ever since. But um, to be sheriff of Yuma County is an honor that will stay with a person the rest of their life. Well, my interest in law enforcement came up uh, in 1969, 1970. I'd uh, been sent out here in the Marine Corps. I was due to get out and I was looking around for a career and I got to hang around with some of the, the guys that, that worked for the sheriff's office and they kind of thought maybe I'd fit in. So I went down, applied, got the job and here I am. When I took over, I knew that we needed to work on the leadership aspect. And I had been fortunate enough to spend the previous 12 years as Sheriff Phipps Chief Deputy. So I got to, to see how things were going and I got to see that, yeah, we were running a good shop, but there were things that could be doing a little different. Um, I did a lot of studying, I did a lot of reading. I'm one of those guys that read all the books that came out about leadership and management and all this stuff, and then tried to put something together that would work for everybody. And the only way to do that was to uh, take the people that you had and say, okay, how can I make them better? Uh, don't try to start all over again. And over the years was able to do that. And, and like I say, during the previous 12 years as a chief deputy, uh, Sheriff Phipps allowed me to have a lot to do with that. When I came in uh, was during the time that computers and uh, a lot of this were coming up. And, and prior to that, I can remember going to uh, Tucson and looking at a computer that they were using for information for uh, intelligence and stuff. And it filled two rooms for the computer. And now we've got it on a cell phone. We had to learn how to use a computer. We had to learn what it could do. And one of the hardest parts was to realize that uh, that computer is only as good as what you put in it for information. Uh, if you don't put it in, you can't get it back. But I think that uh, the other point that comes up when you start looking at this is we now have crooks 
and we have people that, uh, that are out there and they can change in a heartbeat. They have the funding, they have the money, especially narcotics uh, dealers. They have the money and they have the ability. They, if they want to change the way they do things, they can do it in a heartbeat. When it comes to law enforcement and the sheriff's office, we got to develop a plan. We got to write up the plan. We got to get the plan approved. We got to sell the plan to our people. We got to institute it. And by that time, the crooks moved on with something new. And equipment wise, uh, they have always had better radio communications, better computers, better weapons, better vehicles in most cases uh, than law enforcement has. So it's, it's a constant challenge. It was definitely different with the gangs. Uh, the gangs had been here for a long time, second and third generation gangs. Uh, but they really weren't violent. They'd get into some fights with each other and they'd you know, cause some hate and discontent. But it suddenly seemed like uh, the way society had changed, they changed too. And they started uh, becoming um, more violent. They started becoming more in your face. Uh, the last few years I was sheriff, we started seeing a rise in the number of women that were involved in, in the gangs. And I think that one of the things that hurt too was it, it dawned on the bad guys that they could use young kids in the gangs because they couldn't get sentenced to much time even if they got caught doing something. It was only until they were 21. Uh, so it gave empowerment to teenagers and they didn't have the, the maturity and the sense to think of some of the things they were doing and the ramifications. But there'll always be gangs. Uh, today I look at it and it's, it's worse than it's ever been. You know, it just keeps building. And, and as long as society changes the way it is, I don't know how we ever change that. I can think of several situations that uh, during the 20 years I was sheriff that uh, would rate as, as tough. I think probably the, definitely the, the toughest thing was the, uh, the case of uh, Jack Ray Hudson. Jack Ray Hudson was a deputy for me and he worked for the Narcotics Bureau and he got involved in uh, narcotics himself and on July 4th 1996 I was out at the fairgrounds and I got a call that uh, Jack had come unglued and that he'd killed two other officers and uh, he was in custody but he uh, killed a city police lieutenant who's a friend of mine he killed a sergeant for VPS, who was a friend of mine. Uh, and of course it was big news, so everybody, we had all the national networks and stuff. And that was back when everybody was trying to surprise people. It wasn't, I'm going to ask you these questions, it was wait till they had the camera and the, and the microphone in your face and, and you know, try to see if they couldn't get you to say something weird. Or something. But it, it, was, it was bad because it was... Uh, the police department and DPS blamed the sheriff's office. They blamed Jack Ray Hudson, but Jack Ray Hudson wore a brown uniform, so um, the chief and I got together, and we got together with the uh, director of DPS and said, we got, we got to keep this thing whole, we got to work through it. And, and one of the things that was fantastic was that uh, went to the uh, home of the DPS sergeant who'd been killed, Mike Crow, and my guys showed up, and the city showed up, and DPS showed up, and they mowed the lawn and they cleaned up the yard and you know just got together and, and it, was a, it was several years you know that was, it was bitter feelings between everybody. Uh, I was very fortunate in that uh, when it came time for Lieutenant Elkins funeral one of the other ways that we tied things together the family asked me to speak at the funeral service and it was at the convention center and it was full and overflowing but it helped show that hey you, you know one bad guy causes a problem, but it's not the whole organization. We gotta to work together. Uh, Hudson was found guilty. Hudson was sentenced to life in prison, and he's still, I believe, in Perryville right now. But that was definitely a very trying time, and it was something that uh, tore up the community, and it tore up the departments, and it took a long time to get better. But when I left the, the Marine Corps, I went to work for the Sheriff's Office. And they sent me to Parker, and I spent five years, that Parker was part of Yuma County at that time, I spent five years up there as a jailer dispatcher for the first nine months, and from there on as a deputy. And then uh, the sheriff sent me to Welton, so I had the east part of the county for five years as a sergeant. And uh, out there, the sergeant was pretty much, uh, kept you busy. In fact, Sheriff Yancey's version, I asked him, I said, how are you going to know if I'm doing a good job? And he says, I'm going to drive through the valley, and if the farmers aren't waving to me, you're not doing a good job. And I thought that was kind of basic, but it worked. Uh, when Sheriff Phipps came into office, he brought me in as his chief deputy, and I spent 12 years 
uh, working with him as a chief. So I had a good background at that point, and I had seen a lot of things, and I had done a lot of things, uh, so nothing was really surprising. Uh, then I got elected, and uh, when I got elected, I didn't know how long I was going to stick around, whether I really wanted to stick around too long. The one, the one thing about law enforcement, and specifically the sheriff's office, is that every day is a different day, every day is a new challenge, and there's always something when you go home at night that you can think of that you did good for somebody. And uh, usually you ended up doing good for somebody and bad for somebody else. Somebody went to jail, but somebody was happy type thing. But it, it was always just a, you get up in the morning and say, here I am, I wonder what's gonna happen today. Uh, and then I started seeing how everybody was coming together as a tight group and how we were really becoming a family. And that was, that was challenging and it was great to sit back and look at people that uh, normally wouldn't have talked to each other at all, that are suddenly inter interacting and, and flowing together to, uh, to make things better. And, and the bottom line is, that each night you could go home and say, okay, I've made the world just a little bit better for somebody. And uh, I never got tired of it. Because I was there for a long time, and because I had put a team together, and because we all worked together, I was comfortable that I could leave the community for a period of time and I could take my influence and, and the knowledge I had and the friendships that I built up around the nation and put it to help make the southwest border better, Arizona better. I had people like Sheriff Wilmot at that time, folks like that, that as captains and lieutenants that I knew I could leave and I didn't have to worry about anything. So I was able to uh, spend a lot of time working with uh, federal authorities, state authorities, other counties, and, and try to tighten things up, try to take the leadership that I had been able to put into the Yuma County Sheriff's Office and influence uh, the, all the other people that worked in law enforcement. And I, uh, it, it was nice because I could sit back and really see something. The uh, Southwest Border Sheriff's Organization, when we were having problems with the uh, uh, undocumented aliens coming across, and we've had that for a long time, but when it really became important, uh, we got together with 30 sheriffs from Texas, California, New Mexico, and Arizona, and put together an organization that we would go to our state legislatures, or we would go to the federal government, and we were able to walk up there and, as a group and say, wait a minute, you guys aren't listening, you need to understand, you need to listen to us. And, and there were several of us that had a real strong voice, and that, that people listened when you came and talked to them. Uh, it made a difference, but it still hasn't solved the problem. But you don't notice that you've made a change. You don't notice that you've you've really done anything because you're, you're minimalizing everything that goes on. But as I got closer to retirement, I was able to sit back and look at things and say, okay, uh, gee, that really made a difference. You know, all I, I I think the fantastic thing was when I let it known I was retired. I had people come up to me and say, you did this for me. Do you remember it? No, I don't remember it. To me, it was just doing my job, but to them, it meant everything in the world, and it changed their lives in some ways. I have a plaque that's made out of a pair of antique handcuffs from two fellows in Welton when I was out there in 1975 to 1980. They were youngsters, and they were right on the border. You know, they were getting close to really screwing up. I spent some time chewing butt, talking to them, and trying to, trying to work through things. Just before I retired, I got this plaque with the handcuffs on saying, thank you, you made a difference in our life. I said, you know, that, that's great. I, I, I look at uh, Mike Myers, and, and now I'm regressing a little bit, but Mike Myers was a deputy for us, and his truck rolled over out at mile 51 on Highway 95, and he was killed. And it was my duty that day to go talk to his wife and family and work our way through that. And, uh, you know, it, it was a bad day. It was, it was terrible. But when I look back at it, we handled it right. I did what needed to be done, and we all moved on. So, uh, but at the time, it was, I don't know whether we'll ever get over this, but we did, and we became stronger because of it. So I think that uh, I, I've just really been fortunate. I've been blessed. This county's grown tremendously. The sheriff's office has the esteem that we've built, the professionalism. Uh, Everybody builds on those blocks. We start here, we add, and we add, and we add. Well, I, I built it as high as I could. Now it's Sheriff Wilmot's turn to build it as high as he can. Originally, I was uh, stationed here in, the, in Yuma in the Marine Corps, and I was actually a firefighter. And I figured my whole career would be in firefighting when I got out of the military. And I planned on originally staying for 20 years in the military and then retiring and then getting into fire service after that. 
but uh, one of the uh, firefighters that I worked with happened to uh, take his wallet out one day and he had a badge. And I asked him, I said, what is all that about? And he told me that he was a reserve for the, the sheriff's office. And I thought that was kind of intriguing that, you know, he, he was a firefighter like I was, but yet on his off time, he was volunteering and doing law enforcement work for the Yuma County Sheriff's Office. And when he started telling me some of the stories about all the different activities that they would be involved in, of course, that intrigued me. And he told me that they had a ride-along program. So I signed up and did a ride-along. And the first Code 3 run that we went on, I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And, and it's, uh, it was something that I pursued right away. Got involved with uh, the reserves while I was still in the Marine Corps. Got certified through uh, Arizona Western College and kept bugging the sheriffs. You know, as my career started getting shorter and shorter in the military on uh, hiring me on full time. So I was a reserve for uh, two years and was fortunate enough that when I got out of the Marine Corps, I got hired on full time as a deputy. And uh, it's, it's been a dream ever since. So it's been real interesting. You know, one of the things I learned in the, in the military was that uh, you hire people that you can train to take your place in the future. And that's something that I've always uh, used in, in, in my philosophy as far as looking at individuals when they want to get hired on with the sheriff's office. Is this somebody that's there for a job or somebody that wants a career? Because that's important. You know, if you just want a job, then you're in the wrong line of work. I had the, the fortune of working for not only Phipps, because he was the one that hired me when he was the sheriff, and I worked for him, and then I got to also work for Ralph, who was back then the chief deputy. So I got to work for both of the, the former sheriffs and was able to learn a lot from both of the different leadership styles that they had and also incorporate my own into that as well on how I felt things should be done. And because of them allowing me to go out and do the jobs and oversee them and make those decisions, uh, I was able to learn more about taking their place or doing the different responsibilities that they ultimately had. So I was very fortunate that the fact that uh, when Ralph made me the chief deputy, that allowed me to be exposed to the operations of the sheriff's office as a whole. Because it's, uh, you know, being in law enforcement and being out on the street is a whole different ball game when you're talking about the operations of a jail and the administration as well of the sheriff's office. So that was something that I had never been exposed to nor allowed to really get into and be exposed to it and learn how the operations of the sheriff's office as a whole is done. So it, it was an educational experience for me, but by them mentoring me, it, uh, it was able to help me be able to get into the role that I'm working now. You know, the, the, the evolution of law enforcement has changed exponentially since I came to work back in 85, 86, you know, under FIBS. Back then, law enforcement was, you responded to calls for service, you arrested the bad guy. You weren't really involved in the community a whole lot other than that. And as the years have progressed, law enforcement agencies have been called upon to perform a lot more services than they were ever originally intended to do. The uh, partnerships with different uh, civic organizations, for one, um, working with them to better the community, uh, the partnerships that we now have with the schools because of the situations that we're dealing with in law enforcement on uh, active shooters. It, uh, 85, 86, nobody ever even dreamed of anybody doing something like that. So now you're, you're getting more involved with the, the community groups. You're getting more involved with the different organizations that are out there that try to help our community. Uh, anywhere from doing a partnership with the mission to try to help people get back on their feet because of them losing their jobs. It, uh, getting involved with the youth of the communities and, and in the schools doing those partnerships to open up those lines of communication with the youth and as an administrator overseeing a large organization one of your biggest battles is, is staying on top of the current trends you, you just look at the uh, the generational gaps that you have to uh, get in between 
You've got the, the X generation, the Y generation that you're dealing with, and a whole new generation coming up after that. So you've constantly got to be aware of the generation that you're dealing with and how to focus them appropriately to the law enforcement activities that we, uh, we get involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, when you talk about dealing with certain cases nowadays, I mean, it used to be that you arrested the bad guy and then you were done. But now you're more involved in bringing together different organizations that are out there in the community to help the uh, the victims of a crime, to, to help the uh, the juvenile that might have been uh, perpetrated against, get them the counseling that they need, the partnerships that you deal with mental health. Years ago, sheriffs and law enforcement, they didn't deal with mental health. And now, that seems to be the dumping ground is they put everybody in the jails to let them figure it out because the the state does not accept the responsibility nor taking on that uh, that job that they're supposed to be doing. So the mentally ill end up in the jails and then we're tasked with uh, trying to get them the counseling, get them on the right prescription drugs. Um, a jail handles everything. It's like a small community in and of its own. You've got to feed them. You've got to take care of their medical problems. You've got to give them a place to stay. You've got to coordinate with the courts. It's just a, a big, big envelope that uh, used to be that you didn't have to deal with. I mean, the, you look at the, the daily population now. I mean, back in the 80s, you had maybe 200 people in jail. Now you have close to 600 a day. And most of those, out of the 600, there's only like 80 that are sentenced. Everybody else is waiting to go through the court process. You know, but uh, you, you partner with the courts on doing different programs to get our youth back on the straight and narrow so they're not in our jails. You're, you're partnering with them on the, the drug part of it because more and more people are out there doing, unfortunately, narcotics. And you get into the narcotics aspect of it. The, the Being on a border county, we have a lot of battles that we, we have to fight because of our proximity to Mexico where a lot of the cartels, this is where they're trying to get their drugs across and get their money back. So. We in Yuma County, though, are pretty fortunate because we built a relationship with not only the, the cities, but the state and the feds to work collaboratively to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our community because that's our ultimate goal, improving the quality of life for the citizens of Yuma County, and that's what we're here for. And that's to target the, the, the criminal element that's uh, preying on the, the victims in those neighborhoods and getting officers back in those neighborhoods and deterring that criminal element. That's what we're main focus is. Everybody asked me, you know, uh, you ready for this job? You know, and when I ran for election, I think that was, <laughs> that was an educational experience to the political side of the job. But the, the hardest part being the sheriff was having to respond and get that call that uh, your officers have been involved in a fatal shooting. And having to go out to that scene and make sure that uh, the investigation is handled correctly so that you're taking the best care of your troops and also the uh, the suspect's family, making sure that they're kept up to date as well, because you get torn. You know, you, you have a, a bad guy that's uh, threatened the life of your officers and there by the grace of God, you know, they survived and they were able to go home. And that's always something that you want to happen, is your, your officers go home safe to their families. But to also handle the other aspect of it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, I wouldn't want anybody to have to deal with. You know, I've been through other situations where we've lost officers in the past, and uh, you, you never want to make that phone call or make that notification. You really don't. So that, that was my biggest challenge, and that was seven months into my, my term as a sheriff. So <laughs> baptism by fire, they say. To me, it's always important to preserve the history of your agency because not a lot of that was done. So you're, you're always looking through old history books and archives trying to find out, you know, what it was like back then. And to see some of the challenges that uh, those sheriffs faced with the minimal amount of uh, funding, which still occurs to this day, it seems to be a growing trend is they want all this done, but there's no budget to do it, but we still want you to get it taken care of. And that's one of the things that we, we continue to fight as a sheriff, is getting the board to adequately fund us so we can get the needed officers out on the street. 
the you know the basis of the original sheriffs was to collect taxes and to go out and serve writs and uh, arrest the bad guys and bring them back and we still do that to this day fortunately though we're not on horseback because <laughs> you you picture yuma county as big as it was it covered a lot of country and you had to be stretched pretty thin to be able to cover all of that so it's uh to me it's, it's an honor and a privilege because not many people get to be in my position as a sheriff and I feel it's important that we preserve that history so that our youth will be able to go back and look at that and say wow you know what what they did then the the battles that we have compared to the old sheriffs you know are are the same but the the bad guys have gotten more and more sophisticated in in their delivery methods and, and how they do their crimes anywhere from the internet to uh, doing the uh, smuggling of, of drugs into our country to uh, preying on our youth and our elderly. Uh, those things were unheard of way back when, 150 years ago. But we still fight those battles and we utilize our intelligence and our uh, resources to be able to uh, keep on top of those trends and, and try to uh, deter that criminal element from uh, getting the proceeds from their, their activities, you might say. <laughs> committing those crimes against our, our vulnerable that are out there. And a lot of people go, well, what's the difference between a sheriff and, and a city police officer? Well, there's quite a bit. There, there's a lot that goes into it. First, you got to understand that the, the cities, they're incorporated. And those individuals are hired by an HR department and they're put to work for a, a city police department who's basically, their job is dictated by a city council, a mayor, and a city administrator. So they dictate whether they want certain things done or not done in those communities and what is the priorities as far as they are concerned. They tell the chief, this is what we want done. With the sheriff, it's a whole different ballgame. My boss is actually the people of Yuma County. They voted for me to represent them under the Constitution of the state of Arizona and the Constitution of the United States because that's what we swore to uphold. And with that being said, Every officer that's out there, whether they work in the jail or out on the street, they have to be sworn in by the sheriff to actually perform that duty. They're, they're not just sworn in by a judge and then they go to work like the city does. The sheriff dictates who is going to be out there because they actually represent the sheriff himself. And that's the only way that they can do it. You actually have to uh, get hired on, go through the background process, go through the academy get certified and then go through the field training before they ever hit the road. But they still have to be sworn in by the sheriff to be able to conduct those duties even though they're certified in the state because they represent the office of the sheriff. And thus, the sheriff answers to the public. And so, based on what I said I would do for this community is based on what the community wanted when I was voted in as sheriff. So thus, my obligation is to fulfill those promises that I made when I was running for sheriff. And that's the important thing to remember because not everybody can be a sheriff's deputy or a detention officer. You, you're, you're screened because the sheriff is the one that you represent when you're out there in the public. And to me, that's, that's important that people understand that. Uh, what I enjoy the most is, is being able to see other officers getting hired on from the very beginning and looking at them and picturing myself when I first got hired on and how I felt. And what I do now too is I, I remind them 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, that uh, look back on when you first got hired on. What was your goals and what was your objective? And being able to mentor a lot of them into where they are today and, and having a little bit of ability to be part of the reason why they're at where they're at now is watching them grow. I think that's one of the, the best things about it, is seeing the, the young officers moving up through the ranks and uh, actually doing what I was doing when I went through the ranks as well. Sheriffs, when they first started, you know, were the, the very first sheriff had to be appointed by the governor until they had their elections, you know. And to, to be 50 years old, you know, it, it went by quick. But you look at the fact that I, as the sheriff, I'm able to actually go back and look on when I first started 
and to also talk to two of the former sheriffs that overseen the office and did the job and to listen to some of the history that they brought to the table. I mean, you're talking Ralph Ogden with 20 years as the sheriff for Yuma County and then prior to him was John Phipps for at least three terms. And the stories that they could tell you and the different things that went on, it's just amazing. And what's neat is we're actually still here and we can talk to them. Whereas other sheriffs throughout the state probably don't have that luxury like we do. And to be able to do what we're doing now and that's preserve some of this history so that the next sheriff that comes down the line will actually be able to see and hear some of those stories of what went on back then, where most of the time you wouldn't get that. You know, so to me it's, uh, it's important that we look at the history and, and where we've come through the years. You, I remember going from a small office to uh, 1986 when they built a real big sheriff's office and now to see it expanded to where it's got two different locations, substations throughout the county, which we never had before. You know, to, to be able to, to add on to that, that legacy and to be part of that is, is truly a, a humbling experience for me, but an honor as well.